Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's raining again. We love the water. Yeah, we love the water. Um, <laughs> so just by a quick show of hands, how many folks have ever actually heard of Buffalo Niagara Riverkeeper? Wow, <laughs> that's really exciting. Um, I asked that question, and I've been asking that question for, for many years when I do these presentations, and, and steadily as the years go by, more and more hands are popping up, so that, that really makes me feel really good about the work that our incredible team is doing at Riverkeeper. So I'm here to talk to you this morning about Western New York's blue economy, um, or blue-green economy, but it, if you're in this line of work, blue-green has a whole other connotation to it, blue-green algae, uh, which is toxic, so and that's why we just kind of call it blue, uh, the blue economy. If you're not aware of it, you should all realize and understand we live in a very special place on the planet. We are a Great Lakes region, we, our cities are coastal cities, and we have what the rest of the world and the country covets and that is access to 95% of North America's fresh water. Water is the regional issue. Not that I'm biased or anything or, or respective, but if we cannot figure out how to manage and protect our shared water resource, anything that we try to do on a regional basis is, is not going to succeed. And this is the critical issue um, of our time in our region, and I'm doing the wrong way, sorry. So what is the blue economy? Oftentimes, uh, the last couple of years when we've started to talk about Western New York's blue economy, people will look at us and say, you're an environmental organization. Why are you talking about economics? Why are you talking about the economy? Well, we are in a position where we can no longer separate environmental or ecological or social issues from the economy. They are all one. It, it is part of a system. And when we try to characterize and quantify what the blue economy is, uh, you can read the definition for yourself. But basically, any investment that it can either enhance, impact, or benefit, or um, uh, you know, or, or, or have a, a dependence on water is part of the blue economy. Ecotourism, our wastewater infrastructure, our manufacturing, our commercial navigation, our drinking water, it's all related. What happens on the land affects the water. So from a planning perspective, always keeping that water lens or that, that, that thought about what is this going to do to our water. So we talk about you know, how can we also drive change and drive revitalization through the, the reclamation and restoration of the water resource. Because it would be great if we were starting from here and shooting for the stars, but unfortunately we've had a big hole we've had to dig ourselves out of. We've had 100 years, 150 years of impact uh, in our region that we're still trying to undo the mistakes of the past. So as we start to, to move forward and, and integrate and incorporate water issues into the economic revitalization that's happening in our area, we started to, to identify what are some guiding principles, what are some things in the front end that we have to start thinking about it. And at the end of the day, it's shifting the paradigm that it's not just about access to water that then is thought about as a commodity. It's about access and protection of healthy, clean water. And we will not have a strong economy if we don't have a healthy water system. So at the very beginning, healthy water will drive our economic revitalization. We have spent the better part of two generations cut off from our, our greatest resource that we have. Highways, bridges, ground fields, manufacturing facilities, power plants, you name it. Sometimes we would be excited if we had maybe 500 linear feet of access to the water we can actually see it and touch it. And when we started the work on the Buffalo River, which is a case study I'll talk about, for the first two years of the work that we did this, most of the people that we talked to didn't even know there was a Buffalo River. They had no idea, they couldn't access it. So as we start to build up our waterfront and revitalize it again, one of the key principles is, at the very beginning of part portion design, how can we maintain access to this public trust resource, not only for ourselves, but for the future generations? Natural systems being designed into community redevelopment. We have spent many, many decades and generations designing against nature. Put pipes in the ground, put a building up, make the water go away as fast as possible, throw our garbage away. You know, we, we don't really think about how do we integrate system, natural systems into our design. Mother Nature is the best architect, engineer, and artist out there, hands down. So how do we utilize these systems into the fabric of our communities and our developments and uh, just for the health of ourselves? And we'll talk a little bit about green infrastructure and what that means. 
The Niagara River Greenway. Do you folks have heard about the Niagara River Greenway? <coughs> Halfway there, okay. You should know about the Niagara River Greenway, and I'm gonna tell you about the Niagara River Greenway. About five years ago, the New York Power Authority had um, entered into a settlement for its impact on the Niagara River uh, because of its power plant operations. The river can, uh, uh, river's height can fluctuate up to nine feet on any given day due to the water drawdowns, the fish impingement, the impacts on, on the, the system. They were required to, to, to do a settlement um, to offset, to mitigate those impacts, which again, in our line of work, mitigation is kind of a, it's a, it's a positive or a negative, depending on how you look at it. There's a multi-billion dollar settlement of that. Of that, $500 million is completely dedicated to establishing the connector of the Niagara River Greenway from Lake Ontario to Lake Erie. It's a community asset, it's a, and, it, and there's funding that goes with it. It will happen, and the money is there. We just need to get our act together and be able to do it right. And this can be a catalyst for other waterfront development. And ultimately, public, private, and nonprofit partnerships. Oftentimes, we look to our government or we look to the private sector to solve the problems. But the story that we're hearing in the spirit of Buffalo and the spirit of Western New York is the role that nonprofits and community-based organizations and NGOs, not government organizations, these are the people that are really driving change. It's the voice of the community, and it's a collective voice, and it's a voice that's targeted and strategic to add to the solution, not just to scream about the problem. So this is our industrial legacy. When I talked about you know, where we're starting from here, from down here, this is what we had to undo. And this, this was generations of decisions that were made prior to us. As we move forward now, we want to start looking at how, not just about being less bad, but trying to be great. You know, when we look at what was handed to us, this is the Buffalo River. Everybody's heard of the Buffalo River, I hope, yes? <laughs> All right. I would run out here crying if you haven't heard of the Buffalo River after about 10 years of work on this. This is an image of Buffalo Color Peninsula. This is where they used to have um, the indigo dye, aniline, uh, or the Sholkoff uh, industrial plant. And then to the back is the Republic Steel site. Today, this is now known as River Bend, which many of you have, have heard about. But this gives an example of the legacy. So, a little bit of a case study of Riverkeeper. So Riverkeeper, we're actually celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year. Yay! And it's an incredible, an incredible moment of time for us. And I'm also very honored and pleasured to have with us Linda Schneekloth here. If you did not know, it is Linda's, one of, Linda is one of the, the key founders of our organization. And we would not be here today if it wasn't for her work and some other citizens that banded together. So our mission and our goal is pretty simple. You know, how do you protect water quality and quantity, and how do you connect people to water? The image is actually taken from the International Space Station, and you're hovering over the North Pole, and you're looking down on the lake. So Lake Ontario is in the foreground, Lake Erie is in the background. But what do you see? What jumps out at you? You see Grand Island, you see the Niagara River. You can put your finger on a map. Any map you look at, any globe, you know exactly where you are. You know where Western New York is, because we are surrounded by this resource. The story of Buffalo Niagara River Keeper is the story of concerned citizens and citizen planners and lawyers and scientists who formed a volunteer group to make people aware of these resources. And 25 years later, it has now evolved into the work that we're doing today and the impact that we have today. One of the key, um, uh, one of the key programs that we're doing right now that really incorporates true citizen engagement and citizen education. I'm only down about five minutes already. Okay. <laughs> is the environmental justice program. So we look at that, I've got to talk really fast now. When you look at that industrial heritage photo in the imagery of, of what we've left behind, it affects people's health, just as Rebecca was talking about before. And that image right there shows part of the, the Burmese immigrant and refugee population that we're aware very well that where that are starting to flow into Buffalo and Western New York. These folks on any given day get their protein from the Niagara River. They catch fish, the big sheep's head, the carp, the bull head, the bottom feeders, these really big ones. And they take these gigantic fish, they take them home, they boil them, and they make fish paste, which is the base of most of the meals. And they feed this to their wives and their children. And these are the highest risk communities for folks that are, are ingesting contamination from heavy metals to pHs um, to all sorts of, of stuff. So what do we do? We try to communicate. And we communicate and we try to be, to simplify so people can understand these very complex issues. And we translate it into multiple languages. 
So it's not just about you know talking all the wonky science talk, but also really communicating at a level that is useful for people. How do you communicate without words? You know, how are the images driven home so people understand? So to protect human health, to protect the resource, we had to form unique <coughs> partnerships in order to tackle huge problems. Six miles of the Buffalo River is considered a federal area of concern. It took 10 years and almost now $100 million to pull together to get that historical legacy contamination out of the river. That has really formed the backbone and foundation for a lot of the <coughs> inner harbor revitalization we're seeing right now. The Buffalo River is the inner harbor. We have probably, maybe from another 50 to $100 million of private investment that's now coming up and down the Buffalo River corridor because of the work and the promise that this is now going to be a clean and cleaner, sorry, <laughs> we have made it, there's a little nuance there. It's a cleaner, healthier waterway that people now have access to, they want to come down to and enjoy. I know you want to get three minutes, okay. I'm talking really fast. <laughs> so when we talk about um, what is also some of the other numbers and data showing us, we have a problem with our sewers. It's a, a system that's designed to overflow our sewage into our local waterways. Four billion gallons of raw sewage every year is discharged into our waterways. There are unique solutions to this problem. Some of it incorporate using systems designed with nature. How do we separate our stormwater from our sewer water, which will also help enhance the aesthetics of the communities and the in and around the area. Well, that's that triple bottom line. <coughs> Investments in infrastructure, transportation, roadways, all of these can be designed to have a multiplier effect that can benefit water quality, not negatively impact it. It's just shifting those paradigms and leveraging those investments that are already going in for the benefit of the water. This is an example of a combined sewer overflow that discharges that raw sewage river, and you can see the fish in the net that frequent those. Restoring our watershed, 900,000 square miles of land ultimately impact Lake Erie and the Niagara River through all the tributaries. So we also, we look at the micro scale and the macro scale. What is it that's happening in each and every one of these communities? What are the decisions that are being made every day that collectively can either enhance or negatively impact our water quality? At the end of the day, it's about a rust to blue transformation. We have this tremendous history, this industrial history, one of the great cities of the world, one of the great port cities of the world. That, is our, that legacy left us a, a legacy of contamination through the waste that's all over the region to the, this, the designs of, of being cut off from our waterfront. But we are at this moment in time now where the citizen voice is starting to be heard and saying we want our water back. We want our clean water back. And we are starting this transition now to a stronger blue economy. <laughs> so how can you get involved? Many ways you can get involved. Obviously, you can start with our website. That will be a launching pad for dozens of ways that you can engage in Riverkeeper and in the other, the NGO community. I really strongly recommend that you, if you're, if you're willing enough to come on a Saturday to listen to three people talk about this kind of stuff, then you are also motivated enough to try to engage with your nonprofits and your community-based organizations, that these folks are really helping to make a difference and adding a positive voice to the change that's happening. Um, talk to your elected officials. When I, I do lobbying a couple times a year, I go down to Washington and I talk to our congressional representatives, and they tell us they hear more negative things about what people don't like rather than some of the positive things. But if you send an email or you make a phone call and you say, this is what I want to see in my community, you are now a constituent that those elected officials are responding to and carrying forth that message. Your voice can be strong, even if it's just with one voice. They will remember that. So it has high impact. And also, finally, ultimately, get out on the water. Your actions speak more louder than the thousands of words that I can spew up here right now. If you're out there kayaking, walking, fishing, getting out and enjoying the resource, people see that. They resonate that saying, your action is, yes, I want a connection to my healthy water. Um, and that's about it. So I'm in my 15 minutes, and we look forward to the Q&A. <laughs>